Pleasure to, to invite Marcelo Kuperman from Bariloche, from the center in Bariloche, to talk about the destructive effect of hum, human stupidity. I sincerely hope that we can learn how to, to go over this kind of feature, negative feature <laughs> of the humans, especially for politicians. Marcelo, your word. Okay. Thanks, Marcos. Hi, everybody. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for the invitation and congratulate them for the success of the meeting. Uh, I should set it clear that this is a description, not a solution. I'm sorry for that. I couldn't find the solution. Uh, today, I will talk about the, the five fundamentals uh, law of human stupidity that were uh, announced by Carlo Cipolla some years ago, <clears throat> and uh, analysis uh, of this law through uh, an evolutionary game. But uh, let me first introduce you to, to Carlo Cipolla. Um, Carlo Cipolla was uh, an Italian economic historian who, among uh, other writings, uh, he wrote a, a satirical essay on human stupidity. This, this uh, essay was uh, initially intended only to be circulated among friends, but they convinced Cipolla that it was uh, worth uh, publishing it. And so he did. So in 1976, he published The Basic Law of, of, of Human Stupidity, where uh, he explores the, the controversial subject of uh, stupidity. In his own uh, words, uh, stupid people are seen as uh, an incredibly powerful group, which uh, has no regulations uh, or leaders, but uh, nevertheless, uh, they manage to operate in a coordinate way and very successful. So, as I mentioned before, uh, Chipo Chipola uh, postulated uh, five uh, fundamental law that rule the dynamics of stupidity among the population. And to start with this in a very simplistic way, he divided the population into four groups that he called the, the intelligent, the bandits, the helpless, <clears throat> and the stupids. In the next slide, I will characterize uh, each of these groups, but let me tell you something uh, about them to begin with. So the, the intelligent are aware that they are uh, intelligent and they, they know that they are uh, intelligent. The bandits also know that they are evil. The naive or helpless, that is the, the third group, uh, they are painfully imbued with the sense of his own candor. They are very naive. And finally, the stupid, they doesn't know uh, to be stupid. Uh, and this contributes to give a, a greater strength or incidence to the devastating effects of the actions. The stupid is not uh, inhibited by self-consciousness. As uh, he's not aware of being stupid, he has no self-consciousness of what he's doing. So let's explore first the, the two laws and wait until the third, when finally Cipolla defines what is stupidity for him. And with this, he opens also the possibility to characterize the rest of the groups. So uh, the first law established that always and uh, inevitably, everyone underestimates the number of stupid individuals in circulation. Cipolla insists uh, on the fact that any numerical estimate would prove to be uh, an underestimate. And uh, according to a recent talk we have uh, before the talk, I will, I will leave some space here for the Brazilian to add their own uh, image of what they wanted to, to add, okay? So here we have different manifestations Manifestations of stupidity uh, that are affecting us uh, every day. So let's move to the, the second law. Uh, this, Chipola believed that the stupidity is present across all the populations, and this is regardless of their, their gender, the, the race, the nationality, the education level, the income. So according to him, there are stupid people, no matter in which group of, the, of population you will uh, interact with, and even if they are well-educated. So education is nothing to do with uh, stupidity. And the second law uh, established this very clearly. The probability that a certain person is stupid is independent of any other characteristic of that person. So this is a, a, a very pessimistic view of humanity because we are doomed to deal with stupidity. There is no solution for that. There are no safe places or solutions to avoid stupidity. And Perhaps the only thing we can do is accept that we will have to live with stupidity for the rest of our existence. In the third law, finally, Chipola defines uh, stupidity. 
he did not consider stupidity a matter of uh, intellectual quotients, or, but uh, mainly a lack of uh, relational intelligence. He assumes that uh, in everyday transactions or interactions, we can obtain benefits from ourselves and for the others. Or uh, on the opposite way, we can cause harm to ourselves or to the others. According to Chipola, a, a stupid person is one who harms the others and eventually also himself, but never gets a profit for it. Chipola established a difference within this group, saying that uh, there are people who, with their unlikely actions, not only cause harm to other people, but also to themselves. These people belong to the super stupid genre. So finally, stupidity is defined in terms of benefit or harms derivated from any interaction. And in some way, we will define the rest of the groups according to these characteristics. So we can uh, complete the definition of the four groups uh, saying that they can be defined, as I said before, in terms of losses or, or benefits that are self-inflicted or inflicted to others. And thus, the intelligent people are those who benefit themselves and eventually the others, but never cause any harm. The bandits, uh, on the contrary, always cause a harm to others because it is from this harm that they obtain their own benefits. The helpless or naive always enrich the others and many times at their own expenses. And finally, the idiots, as Chipola has uh, already defined, uh, they cause a harm to others without getting any benefits for that, and sometimes also even harming themselves. Now, this characterization can be translated to a bidimensional uh, space where the X uh, axis correspond to the self effects and the Y axis corresponds to the effects that are inflicted on the others. So each of the four quadrants define uh, different groups. Here we have the intelligent people where the effects on the others and on themselves is positive. Here we have the bandits, where the effects on themselves is positive, but the effects on the others is negative. Here we have the helpless people that have a positive effects on the others, but probably a negative effects on themselves. And finally, the stupid that have a negative effects on the others and also a negative effects on themselves. So we will uh, call these groups uh, phenotypes. And so we have uh, four phenotypes. And in this next slide, we have a sort of cartoonish representation of the plot we have at the right. So here we have uh, different situations of people interacting uh, between them. And here is the headless that is selling a used pig for a very low value. The intelligent has uh, fed the pig and is selling it to another person and both the, they take a profit from this uh, negotiation. The bandit is waiting for a person to steal the pig. And here we have the idiot that is uh, work, uh, working with uh, a dog and doesn't, uh, cannot see that there is someone uh, in a ladder working and he uh, produces uh, an accident. So uh, we have already described uh, the four groups. We have uh, announced uh, three of the uh, five law. So let's move to the fourth law that uh, reveals the secret, uh, an avoidable weapon that stupid people have. According to Chipola, we continually forget the danger that stupid people represent. Cipolla says stupid people are dangerous and unfortunate because reasonable people find it difficult to imagine and understand a stupid behavior. For example, a bandit is always a bandit and it is clear what we can expect from people belonging to, us, to that group. So precaution would be taken against them. But with stupid people, things are rather different. Generally, their attack takes us by surprise. And even when we suffer it, we find it difficult to organize a rational defense because the attack itself lacks of rationality. So by underestimating the power of stupidity, we remain somehow vulnerable and therefore uh, uh, the mercy of the, this uh, unpredictability. We can also fall into the, the error of thinking that uh, a stupid person can only hurt himself, and this is not true. Uh, the idea is that uh, stupid people also can harm uh, 
us. And uh, so Cipolla uh, uh, announced uh, his uh, fourth law that summarized all this idea in a very compact but precise formulation. Uh, the idea is that non-stupid people always uh, underestimate the damaging power of stupid individuals. In particular, uh, non-stupid people constantly forget that uh, at all times and places, and any, under any circumstance, uh, to deal or associate with uh, stupid people always turn out to be a costly mistake. So we have uh, up to now uh, for laws, let's move to the last one. Uh, the last one uh, is uh, an overwhelming fifth law because uh, it says us that the stupid people is the most dangerous type of person. The corollary helps us to remember that a stupid person is even more dangerous than a bandit. Because what I mentioned before, uh, against a bandit, we know what to expect, but we don't know what to expect from a stupid person. So. At this point, uh, we can begin to wonder if uh, each of us is truly exempt from stupidity. So in the hopes that no one takes uh, this personally and assuming that uh, you will understand the sarcasm in the following uh, quotation, I would like to quote uh, Mathis van Voxeld that uh, in his Encyclopedia of Stupidity says, no one is intelligent enough to understand their own stupidity. So now we, that we have characterized uh, stupidity and we know the, the five law, five fundamental laws of stupidity announced by Cipolla, let's move to the formulation of the game through which we want to analyze this law. So in order to mathematically analyze uh, the, the law proposed by Cipolla, uh, we are considering here uh, an interpretation of this law in terms of uh, an evolutionary game. Uh, in this evolutionary game, we have uh, two players that play each against the other uh, in each match, and uh, the strategies adopted by each of the player will be linked to one of the phenotypes uh, defined by Carlo Cipolla. So the characteristic of uh, each of these uh, strategies uh, will be given in terms of the gains or losses resulting from interactions. So we will call uh, P to the gains or losses that an individual costs to him or herself. That means uh, the x-axis, the values on the x-axis. And we will call Q to the gains or losses that an individual inflicts on others. That means the values on the y-axis. So uh, taking into account what is P and Q, we can say that uh, an intelligent person will uh, always get a gain uh, for him or herself. So P i is greater than zero and qi that is the effect on the others can be zero or greater than zero so qi is greater than zero the bandits will uh, always uh, get a gain from any interaction but will cause so this is greater than zero but will cause a harm on the others so this is negative so qb is negative because of the of the harm produced on the others for the the helpless here, we have that uh, the gain produced on the others, uh, QH is greater than zero, and eventually uh, PH, that is the, the gain or loss uh, produced to themselves, can be zero or eventually uh, less than zero. And finally, the stupid, we have here the stupid, uh, where both quantities are negative. So they produce a harm on the others, and also their gain is zero or negative. So with this, we have uh, the possibility of uh, writing a, a payoff matrix that we will use to define the game, or the, what we call here the Chipola game. The matrix looks like this. Here in this matrix, in each of the, the elements of the matrix, we have the payoff of a given strategy when uh, confronting to another one. For example, let's take the, the first file. This file corresponds to the intelligent group. So this is the payoff obtained by the intelligent group when confronting another intelligent person. This is the payoff of the, an intelligent person when confronting a bandit. This is the payoff of an intelligent person with confronting 
a helpless person, and this is the payoff of an intelligent person when confronting a stupid. And we can go on by describing the rest of the matrix in the same way. But here, uh, so we, ha we have this payoff matrix, uh, but the, besides or uh, together with the restrictions that we have on the values of P and Q for each of the groups, we will adopt uh, another uh, restrictions. And this is uh, with the idea that the subgame corresponding to a situation where only the intelligent and the bandit plays. So that means that we are considering that the, we have only two strategies and we have only the intelligent and the bandits. And that corresponds to this part of this block of the, of the matrix. It corresponds to what we call a prisoner dilemma. For the prisoner dilemma, there are some conditions to be fulfilled. And these conditions are the following. We need that the payoff of a bandit when confronting an intelligent person be greater than the payoff of an intelligent person when confronting an intelligent person, and this to be greater than the payoff of a bandit when confronting another bandit, and this to be greater of the payoff of an intelligent person when confronting a bandit. This is something that needs to be fulfilled for the subgame to be a prisoner delay. I will explain later why we choose to take this as a or this subgame as a prisoner dilemma. But the important thing is that to fulfill this situation, if we remember that uh, QB is less than zero and QI is greater than zero, and we look at these uh, inequations, it is enough to consider that PB be greater than PI to fulfill this condition. And this is all we need to know. So we need PB to be greater than PI as a condition to be sure that the subgame corresponding to intelligent and bandits is a prisoner dilemma. I will explain later why we decided to do that. So the, the usual formulation for uh, an evolutionary game is to consider that the, the abundance of each uh, phenotype is given by, a, can, can be characterized by a fraction in the population. And uh, this fraction will be denoted by X. So uh, XK is the fraction of players with the given strategy K, with K uh, adopting the values intelligent, bad, helpless, and stupid. And we can write, uh, we can consider, for example, for the evolution of the, the frequencies of these uh, uh, fractions, different uh, uh, evolutionary dynamics. The most known and used evolution is that the one given by the replicator equation that says that the frequency of a given population evolves according to the difference between the payoff of this population when compared with the mean payoff of the rest of the population. So we have to make this difference between the payoff of a population and the mean payoff of the total population. If this is positive, so the derivative will be positive, and this is negative, the derivative will be negative, and this is proportional also to the already present fraction of players with a given strategy. If we remember the, the payoff uh, matrix, we will perhaps wonder what happened with the Q values. And the Q values can be ignored due to a property of the replicative equations that says that we can, given the payoff matrix, we can add a constant to a given column of the payoff of the payoff equation, and the uh, replicator equation will remain uh, unvaried. So, if we add a given constant to a whole uh, column in the mat in the uh, payoff matrix, the replicator equation will produce the same dynamics. So, what we do is. Here we uh, subtract the value of Q for this whole column. Here we subtract QB, here QH, here QS. And as a result of this operation, we have a matrix where only the values of P remain and the possibility of writing the replicator equation is uh, much more straightforward and much easier where we have only here the values of P and the values of Q have disappeared. So this is the equation we have to analyze in order to uh, evaluate the, the uh, dynamics of the densities of the is of the population according to the replicator equation. 
If we do that, uh, we will find that uh, if we consider a mean field uh, model where everybody can play with everybody else, we observe that uh, we have only uh, one uh, steady state, and this steady state corresponds to the fact that the only, the only group that survives are the bandits. And this is something that is associated also to the Nash equilibrium of the game. The Nash equilibrium of the game will be being a bandit. And if we consider this replicator equation, the only solution is to have a, a population of bandits and nothing else. So what we decided to do is to analyze, uh, instead of considering a, a mean field situation, to consider the possibility of the players uh, to be on top of uh, an underlying network with several characteristics that will be defined uh, soon. And this is also the reason why we have chosen to make the subgame uh, Intelligent Bandits a uh, prisoner dilemma, because we know that uh, when considering a prisoner dilemma in a mean field situation, there is only one solution, and the solution is related to the Nash equilibrium of the game. But when the game is played on top of a network, there are many other solutions that uh, present much many or many interesting features that are not revealed when we consider only a mean field situation. So that's why we okay. So that's why we decided to uh, play on network. So I will skip the the characteristic of the network. We have. Uh, work with a family of networks that goes from regular to random by adding some disorder of the network. This is not exactly the same as the Strogratz uh, Watts model. There are some differences. By the difference we introduce, we can uh, have always regular networks. That means that all the nodes have the same degree. And I will show you the results. Uh, we have, uh, we work with uh, three dynamics we, we call rational imitation, specific imitation, and a probability of occasionally being stupid. We will analyze the mean profit of the population, the, the mean payoff of the population in a given round, and also the ratio between the density of intelligence to the bandits in a given population. So here are the results. Uh, this is for the rational imitation, so each player imitates after a given round the best neighbor. So, for example, if we have a, an intelligent and intelligent sees that the bandits are uh, going much better than him, so he can decide to change the strategy. So there is an imitation uh, dynamics that allows the players to change their strategy. So we can see here. This is the, the ratio between intelligent and bandits. And here we have the, the profit of the population. In the first two plots, what we are changing is the degree of disorder of the network that I didn't define. But here, what we change is the amount of initial stupid in the population. And we see that uh, uh, for different uh, degrees of disorder of the network, there are different behaviors. If we start to increase the number of idiots, uh, stupid in the population, for some networks, the ratio between intelligence and bandits start to decay and then grows again. And for other uh, topologies, it always grows. So it, this is something that is contradictory because apparently what we have is that the presence of stupid favors the evolution or the presence of intelligent people and, and thus the increase of the income of the population. We will explain what is happening here. So maybe what we decided to do is just to, instead of uh, using the rational imitation, to use a specific imitation. In a specific imitation, uh, each strategy imitates according to the characteristic of the strategy. For example, the, the bandits always imitates the higher payoff. The intelligent imitates the higher global payoff. But also avoiding to have global payoff. And stupid remains stupid because uh, he doesn't know that he's stupid, so there is no need to change the strategy. If we use this specific imitation, we start to see something uh, different. So the, the ratio starts to decay. And here there is a clear effect of the presence of stupid among the population. So the profit of the whole population starts to decay. And 
also the ratio between intelligent and bandits all uh, start to decay. So as I have uh, only a few minutes, I would like to go to the last uh, case that maybe is the more interesting. And this is a case where we have intermittent stupidity. That means that players can be only uh, bad, intelligent, and helpless uh, in a permanent way. And there is a probability that each of the players uh, at a given time plays like stupid. So stupidity is not a permanent uh, situation, a, a permanent state, but there is a probability for each of the players to play at a given time like a stupid. And here we can see in the, ax in the x axis, the probability of playing uh, like a stupid. And here again, what we can see is the fraction of intelligence among the population. And here we see that there is a sort of transition between a state where the intelligent population can survive and another state where the bad population is the one that survives. And there is a transition, or apparently a, a, this is a crossover, with a change of two regimes where according of the, this probability of playing stupid, if the probability is low, still the population remains intelligent and the income of a society is high, but if the, if the possibility of playing stupid is high, the population will turn into bandits. Uh, this uh, plot can be uh, collapsed, all the curves can be collapsed according to uh, different, so we have rescaled the probability of uh, being stupid in a proper way to make all this uh, graph to collapse in, on, in one curve. And we can see that there is a clear transition between, between two different regimes. So just to be on time, I will just mention the conclusions very fastly. Uh, for the cases one and two, uh, even the, the smallest fraction of stupid people produce a notable effect. And as the fifth law established, the stupid person is more, uh, is more dangerous uh, than a bandit. We have found uh, some exceptions where the stupid group seems to exert contradictory effects and favoring the propagation of intelligent players and leading to a higher mean profit. This can be explained by a phenomenon that we uh, have described as screening. The, the, the presence of idiot population screens the intelligent people and avoid the interaction between intelligent and bandits that will lead to a propagation of bandits instead of to the survival of intelligent people. Uh, at the same time, during uh, the transient presence of stupid, uh, the intelligent group uh, strength, so that, I mean, we, we observe that this screen effects uh, is uh, present during the transient where uh, the presence of uh, stupid people favors the initial growth of intelligent person, but then uh, this effect disappears. And uh, for the intermittency case, uh, the results show the existence of a crossover between two different regimes. The transitions from the cooperative regime to a defective one is uh, only sharp for slightly disordered networks. Uh, the, the curves show that while for low values of a stupid population, uh, the disorder of a given network uh, attempts against the intelligent, the situation is reversed for a high degree of disorders. And also it is possible to collapse all the curves. So to finish, uh, what I wanted to say is that I have not a solution for stupidity. The idea of this uh, work that has uh, itself some sarcasm is to show that uh, the consideration of non-rational players in uh, an evolutionary game can lead to uh, surprising results. In particular, the, the stupid phenotype is a sort of non-rational player. And what we have analyzed here is the effect of this sort of uh, player in, uh, in the outcome of a, a game that we have called the Chipola game. So this is all I wanted to mention to you. Uh, and perhaps there is some, a couple of minutes for questions. If not, I will just see the question of the chat. Thank, thank you very much for this very nice talk. I really enjoy it, but uh, we don't have time. So I, 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 I can see in the chat some questions, three or four questions. So please, Marcelo, 
respond directly in the chat, okay? So okay. we should move uh, once more. Uh, thank you. We should move for, for to the, to the next and the last one speaker of this workshop is um, is um, I'm sorry here uh, is uh, oh. Jose Fontanari. Yes, uh, Jose Fontanari from where is my appointment? <laughs> Yeah, from University of São Paulo. Uh, ah, yeah, are you seeing my screen? Yeah, but it's, it's a blank page. Yeah, oh, so it's not my screen then. Mm. Yeah, now you're seeing my screen. Yes. Are you? Right. Wisdom of crowds, fact or fake? Please, Fontanari. So, thanks for the organizer for uh, the invitation to give this uh, final talk of this very nice workshop. Well, uh, just to mention uh, a social psychologist that probably everybody knows, Daniel Kahneman, they say that you usually remember uh, the best talk in a conference and the last talk. So I have quite a responsibility here in uh, closing this conference, right? Uh, we have seen a lot of interesting material during this week, and most of them are uh, addressing uh, recent talks in politics and economics. But now I want to go back uh, about uh, a century and a half ago and describe a phenomenon which is still now seen as a mystery. And it's very nice to study mysteries in, mysteries in science, and uh, there will be opportunity to show you another problem. Uh, and uh, perhaps if you can solve it, uh, you can be famous, right? And the problem is uh, the list of crowns. And actually, it was introduced in the literature in, or in the scientific community in uh, 1906 when uh, Francis Galton uh, went to Plymouth because of health problems. And uh, he went there and was basically spending some time and decided to visit a agricultural fair. And in this fair, uh, there was a, <clears throat> a contest where you have to buy tickets actually to guess the weight of a box, of an ox, by the way, of a, a fat ox. And uh, of course, if you win the context, you probably, if I win the context, I mean that your guess was the closest to the real weight of the, of the box. Uh, you probably get some money or perhaps even the ox itself, right? And uh, what uh, Gauti find out was after uh, the context was finished, Gauti had access to all the estimates, they borrowed them, and then he did some statistics. Actually, he calculated the median of the estimates and uh, found out that uh, the median uh, gives a estimate that was only 0.8% higher than the true weight of the ox. That was amazing. And I mentioned that the reason uh, got to choose the median and not the mean or the arithmetic average was first because uh, Gautam invented the notion of the median, and uh, that was an opportunity to, let's say, to make some propaganda of it. And second, because if you choose the median, you uh, avoid the effect of outliers. Outliers means that someone gives a totally crazy estimate of the weight of this ox. If you take in account the median, you just disregard this crazy uh, guess. While if you use the mean, the arithmetic mean, uh, this can have a strong influence on your guess. 
So what Galton did was to use the medium right, and found out that was an extremely good uh, estimate of the real weight of the ox. For instance, in this case, the real weight was 540, <coughs> 545 kilograms. And the uh, basically the medium gives an estimated which was something like uh, 500 kilograms, right? And uh, once he got this result, he wrote this paper in Nature. It appears in 1907. This was actually his last paper on statistics, right? He was at eight four years old at the at that time. And in this paper, he basically emphasized, I mean, the trustworthiness and uh, the accuracy of the popular judgment. He started with this mention about these democratic days, and then he mentioned that uh, somehow uh, the judgment of people should be trusted. Uh, and this very simple experiment was perhaps a support for the idea of democracy. And of course, I recall to you that uh, Galton was not exactly a Democrat in the modern sense, especially because he invented the notion of uh, eugenics and actually have, uh, had a, a journal basically to support defining supporting eugenics. But that was really surprising. I just mentioned that if instead of using the median that uh, Galton used, and at that time, the median was called the middlemost estimate, if he used the simple arithmetic mean, uh, he would get an even preciser estimate. For instance, the error of the estimate of this ox A would be 0.2% only if you use the median. And this, uh, this value, this figure I give here, it's at 542 kilograms, was obtained with the median. Right? But it was really, I mean, surprising. Uh, Gaudin didn't give an explanation. Actually, he didn't have an explanation for that. It was just a mystery, let's say, but that supported this notion of uh, the validity, validity of the popular judgment. That was very nice. And uh, Galton called the paper and called it the phenomenon Vox Populi. That was basically forgotten for, uh, say, one century. And uh, in 2004, this economist, James Sulojewski, uh, wrote this paper, this, this book, by the way, uh, whose title was The Wisdom of Crowds. This is the first time that this expression, wisdom of crowds, appeared in the literature or appeared in the scientific community. And he began the book describing Galton's experience. Right? So, I mean, probably today we know uh, this adventure of Galton at uh, the Plymouth Fair because of Suryev's book. And in this book, Suryev gave a definition of what wisdom of crowds means not only to him, but to people that work on the subject today. The wisdom of crowd is the idea that the collective beats all individuals or at least most of them. So you see that there are actually two versions of the wisdom of crowds. One is the strong versions, that means that the collective beats all individuals, and a weak version that means that the collective beats most of the individuals. By most of the individuals, I mean beats the majority of the individuals. So, uh, uh, sorry, I was not only uh, exhibited this uh, result by Galton, but I also mentioned several other experiments, especially in the context of uh, politics, economy, and so on, basically saying that if you combine uh, the estimates or the opinion of expert, you get a best opinion again. I mean, you get a better opinion than of the experts themselves. 
So combination of independent gas is a good idea, is an idea that all companies or schools or whatever should use right, to improve the decision-making performance. Uh, and for instance, uh, I myself made two experiments on that line, basically following uh, Suryad's suggestions. One of the classic experiments was this uh, number of candies in a jar. So I had an undergraduate student, Dudley Norton, who went around the campus with this jar of candies and asked about uh, 130 students how many candies there was in the bar. So he recorded all the gases, just to mention to you, the number, the actual number of candies in this jar was 636. And here you have a histogram of the gas. Well, the histogram is normalized in the X as is basically the gas, but I divide by the mean gas. And it happened that we define the mean gas as the collective gas, right? Different from Gauton that uses the median. Now I'm using the arithmetic mean. And in this case, the collective gas, which is basically the mean, is 531. So uh, that's a, a little bit, I mean, different, not such a close accuracy. But even so, it was better than 70% of the gas. And remember that according to Sudoyaki, uh, the definition of this of count was not necessarily, necessarily a good accuracy, but the definition was that the collective gas was better than the majority of the individual's gas. So I'm using this uh, weak formulation, right? And uh, in particular, I had an index, which I will focus on, which is the fraction of individuals who guess better than uh, the collective, right? So in this case, psi would be 0.3. It's basically the opposite of this uh, first statement here. So you got that. It's very interesting in the sense that this simple experiment shows that uh, uh, the reasonable counts. Why show that? Because the collective repeated 70% of the individuals. We repeated this experiment uh, for a book. It just uh, that we went around the campus showing this book, I mean, the profile of the book, and asking the students how many pages there was in the book. Right. Uh, by the way, in the first experiment of the candies, the idea was that uh, the student who gets it closer to the true value would get the jar of candies. And in the case of the book, the student who gets it the closest to the actual number of pages would get the book. Right. And just to mention, the actual number of pages was uh, 704, right? and the collective guess was. 560. Remember, the collective guess was simply the average of the individual guess. Here is uh, the histogram. You see there are some uh, similarities in the shape of the histogram. They could be quite, uh, uh, <clears throat> they could be uh, fitted by gamma functions, but you have no interpretation for that. But what really matters is that in the case of the book, Again, I have that the collective is, was better than 62% of the gas. So you see, again, the wisdom of crowd happened here. Right? And again, I introduced this index psi, which is the fraction of the individuals, uh, fraction of the gas of the individuals that are better than the collective. In this case, it is 0.3. Is 0.37. Right? And of course, uh, the idea to verify if the wisdom count is a robust phenomenon or if it exists at all was just check if it is two versions, the strong version or the weak versions are correct. In these two experiments, you see that the weak version is correct. 
right? Is there an explanation for that? No, it is a mystery. There is no explanation. There are some attempts to explain that, uh, but it's easy to show that those attempts are plainly wrong. So it is still a mystery. And perhaps you can realize why it's a mystery at the end of this talk. So I hope everybody understood that uh, a width of a cloud experiment means a distribution of gas. And if you have a distribution of gases of independent gas, this is an important point, right? I can get this collective estimate. And from the distribution, I can see if uh, this definition of a quiz double clause is valid or not, basically calculating the fraction of individuals who guess better than the collective, right? For the wisdom of crowds to exist, I need psi less than 0.5. So in these two examples, it's true, wisdom of crowds appears and it seems to be a real phenomenon. And here I just mentioned two experiments. You see lots of these uh, single experiments described in this book or in papers that you find in the literature. But if you combine all of them, probably you not get more than 20 experiments. And most of them, I would say all of them, uh, basically corroborate this notion that uh, wisdom crowds is a real thing. But it is a mystery. So if somebody can find an explanation, he, this somebody will probably be famous, at least in the statistics community. But you can say, well, how can you ensure that uh, the phenomenon is real true if you have just uh, a couple of uh, ends of experiments? Actually, you cannot be sure, but in the option would be to ask undergraduate students to go around the campus, right? And uh, obtain, let's say, some thousand of experiments um, involving the gas of the number of candies, or if you want, the gas of numbers of pages of books. But that is basically impossible, and probably this is the reason people don't have a definitive answer about the uh, if this phenomenon is real or not. But I know situations where this sort of wisdom crowd experiment was realized not in the context of wisdom of crowds, but was realized during a long time, uh, which are the uh, economic forecast of economical index. For instance, this database of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia has about uh, exactly uh, almost 9,000 forecast experiments. The forecasts are for different economical index and are also for different quarters. For instance, it starts in 1968, and then you have forecasts for the next quarter, for the next, the next quarter, and so on until one year from the beginning. And this is repeated for all years. So you have plenty of experiments, and the number of forecasts, or the number of individuals in each of these economic forecasts, ranged from nine to eight, seven. So what you did was just uh, going through this database, organize the experiments, organize the forecast. And it is important because if someone forecasted the unemployment rate in 1970, on let's say June 1970, I'm sure that uh, I know the true unemployment rate in June 1970. So I can compare. Uh, I can obtain actually the accuracy of the forecast, and also I have the distribution, and also I can compute, which is more important, I can compute this fraction, which is the fraction of the gas that are superior to the gas of the collective. So what you did is just to pick each one of these experiments and do the analysis that you did in the case of 
the candies in the case of the book. Just make the histogram of the gas, compute the quantitative gas, now I have the true value, and then I calculate the fraction of gas that are better than the collectives. And in this histogram here, this fraction is basically the number of bars that are in this, the number and the height of the bars that are in this gray zone here. Okay, so simple as that. Now I have thousands of experiments, so I can check if the with of crowns is the real phenomenon or is something that people who like different things uh, have observed. And what you get is the following. Note that I always repeat the definition of wisdom crowns. I mean, the strong definition and the weak definition. And I recall that most of them means the majority of them. So what I do, I do that for each of experiment, I calculate this fraction, which is fraction of the individual gas that are better than the collectives. This is the psi, and I have basically 9,000 experiments. So I have this sequence of numbers, and then I count the number of experiments for each this fraction lays behind, lays, I mean, inside this interval. Basically, what I introduced was a bean size for this fraction. This is not that relevant, but if I want to design to build a histogram, I need this bean size. And the frequency that appears in this X here is simply uh, the number of experiments in that bean divided by the total number of experiments, which is 8,650. This is the main result of our paper. And what you see is this nice histogram. And I recall, if you can see my mouse, is that all the experiments for which psi is larger than 0.5 were experiments where the wisdom of Krauss phenomenon didn't happen, right? Because in this case, the majority of the individuals perform better than the collective. And if you want some numbers, and now these numbers make sense in the sense that I have a very good statistics, basically 9,000 experiments, nobody has done anything closer to that. And we conclude that indeed the collective beat the majority of individuals in basically 70%, 67% uh, of the experiments, right? But that also means that the wisdom of crowds is not present in 33% of the experiments. And more important, if you want to verify the strong statement of the wisdom of crowds, in a sense, that the collective is best, is better than all individuals. I have to check how many experiments I get psi equals zero. I mean, psi equals zero means that absolutely no individual gets it better than the crown, even the experts. And you are talking about expert on these forecast experiments. That would be amazing. And what I got here is that only in 1.7% of the experiments, this happened, right? In 98% of the experiments, this strong statement of the wisdom of Krauss is false, right? And the weak statement of the wisdom of Krauss is false in 33% of the experiments. Basically, uh, this result, uh, where in basically less than 2% of the experiments, uh, they cannot beat it all individuals, uh, just uh, uh, indicate that you should go for the expert, right? Not follow the count, but follow the experts. This is basically a lesson following Marcelo's uh, seminar on the stupidity of human decisions. And finally, I conclude the talk 
And uh, I have just this major result to show to you that basically organized all what you know about the statistics of the use of cars is that uh, perhaps this is not a real phenomenon. I mean, all the fame, all the first, all the argue about the use of crowds is most likely due to this selective attention fallacy, which means if I do an experiment and if I combine the estimates and for some reason I got the mean estimate very highly accurate, I just published the result, mentioned the result, and publicize the result. And in, in the other case, I probably forget about the experiment, right? So I think that uh, this is really not a phenomenon. It, it certainly doesn't deserve all this ad about it, all this fuss about this, all these books and papers written about it, because it's essentially a statistical phenomenon. I basically uh, show you that in 33% of the experiments, I couldn't see this phenomenon. That's it. Thank you so much for uh, the attention. Thank you for staying till this point. And all the details about this uh, statistical analysis and also, and this is important, the arguments showing that the explanation that people attempted to use to explain the use of crowds are essentially wrong. I mean, the experiments show that uh, the experiments basically contradict the assumption of the explanation that you find in the literature. So this 70% success of the count is, is still a mystery if you want, right? But for me, it's not a big mystery, it's just a detail that probably the statistics, statisticians will be involved in the next years. So thank you again, and I'm ready for the questions, if you have some. Uh, thank you, um, Fontanari. Uh, I see a couple of questions in chat. It's Maybe you can read it directly and then answer to people. Uh, yeah, let's see. Where it starts? Uh, it starts from Sebastian. I was thinking the same how the reason of uh, depends on the size. I guess this was the first question, right? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No, no, there's not. How many guesses did you consider? The estimate improves in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, you see, Andrea, that the range of uh, the range I used was n between nine and eight seconds. I, I had no control over it. This was uh, the number of economists guessing in uh, in each quarter, right? But of course, I tried to control the value of n to see what happens if n is small and if n is in the other extreme, if n is around eight. And uh, we find that there was basically no effect. In fact, uh, this was one of the things that I was looking for to see the effect of the group size. But in these experiments, you got absolutely no effect. Uh, No, no, Philippe, uh, that, that makes no sense, right? Asking how many words a book has is just, uh, I have no idea uh, how, how people would uh, estimate this, right? You see, the number of pages, you have some experience with books. So you, you have an educated guess on the number of pages. You also have some experience in seeing, I mean, how many candies there are in that jar. You see the size of the jar and you have an educated guess. But the words in a book, it's uh, very difficult, right? You see, you have to do a multiplication. I mean, he has the number of pages and they say, well, there are a hundred words in each page and do that. But uh, the idea of this experiment is to use the intuition. Right? not to use the calculation. I mean, the guy just see the jar and say, ah, there are a thousand. 
uh, candies in there. Just the idea is to play with the intuition, like the lay people. And uh, Sebastian is again asking how the wisdom depends on the size. In these experiments, I have this very small range of size, and we actually saw no effect. You studied that, you focused on that, but you couldn't see any effect. In the paper with Dati, right, uh, we studied the effects because you basically sampled. You see, I had uh, 127 uh, students guessing the number of candies, and then I construct groups from these 107 individuals. Just pick up uh, 10 individuals at random and say, well, okay, so what would be the guess if there were 10 individuals? Then you see uh, this group effect, but then the groups are not independent because all them were sampled from a single experiment, okay? So I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, size must have an influence, but uh, the experimental data I have is not enough. Uh, make a second round with people checking the other guests. Uh, Sebastian, the essential, I mean, the crucial point about wisdom of craft is that the wisdom are independent, right? So the whole idea is that uh, they don't have access to the previous guests or to the guests of the other individuals. So independence is an essential point. The idea that the crowd can be better than individuals does not make sense. If you consider the opinion of an expert compared to average people, how does it take that into account in such ground model? Over the years, there will be the strong statement of the result crowds. And uh, basically, the, my statistics show that you should not disregard this, the experts. In 98% of the experiment, if you choose the expert, that you choose the right. You get an estimate better than the collective estimate. So I hope this answers your question. Is to the people are useful? Sure, they are. This is an important point, Sebastian, because if I remember, I use the uh, Celia, please interrupt me if uh, I pass the time. Uh, uh, remember that if you use uh, say the median in the case of uh, of the Gautos experiments in play mode. Uh, actually, using the median means basically disregarding these uh, outliers, and that gave a worse estimate than using the average. So, so actually, these outliers are important. And for instance, if I in my experiments that use the average, if I disregard the outliers, because, oh no, that guy is, uh, was not taking the experience serious, but I get a worse result. Somehow the outliers uh, balance uh, the massive number of guests, which are, let's say, lower than the current one. So outliers are important, is that people are useful. Thank God. Thank you very much for, uh, for the okay. uh, well, I think now we should move on and we have some final words about the conference. So I would like to invite uh, the really drive force behind this conference. Of course, uh, Noon and myself have uh, helped to organize it, but uh, no doubt that Celia has been the, 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 the the brain of the of the whole event. So, Celia, please, our, our final words and for our participants. Do you want me to give some final words? Okay, I I was just uh, to to acknowledge all the uh, all of you for the great contribution really i i wanted this meeting to to go on <laughs> i am sad that it finished because i found very very interesting all the talks and so uh, i want to to acknowledge all of you all the participation uh, also as, uh, answering the, the questions it has been very 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 nice and um, I want also to, to acknowledge the ICTP Saifir for the, the possibility uh, to, to offer to you this, this meeting, to all of us this meeting. 
And uh, well, I hope that there will be a next time in person so we can um, meet face to face. And um, well, uh, uh, I don't know if you, I, I, I already said something eh, about the, our proposal for the special issue about uh, sociophysics, not linked to the event, but uh, more general that will appear uh, it has been uh, accepted to appear in causal and fractals, and you will know soon about uh, it with more details. Uh, I don't know, uh, Marcos, if you want to, to add, uh, Nuno, you want, want to add something? Oh, uh, I, I, Important, I, I forgot. Mine, I make mine in your words, and also I would like to say that uh, many people here know the history of this conference, in this, this workshop, in the sense that uh, Back two years ago, I were talk, thinking about having presential, I mean, get together really in Sao Paulo, maybe, probably, uh, uh, and then discussing, have a nice time in doing coffee break, dis discussing this, um, I, I would say it's a relatively new, at least in Brazil, uh, relatively new area of, of the statistics, physics, which is sociophysics, but now is already in the independent uh, area for the of our research. So unfortunately, we have these pandemics. And uh, uh, at some point, we thought to, to just uh, let's give up and wait for two, one or two years later to, 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 do, to, to really make this happen. But then we, we realized that it, uh, uh, it's timely. We should really have this conference even if it, in this way, I mean, you know, online. So we really uh, would thank everybody for the great effort in getting time for this, uh, this pandemic uh, uh, period and participate in this conference. So we are really grateful to everybody that have contributed to this, uh, uh, in your opinion, important, important conference because somehow has opened at least for Brazil and maybe South America that it has this, this very important area of research, uh, has very nice things to, to tell people about how physics, science in general, but especially physics can be help, very helpful to, to make it, we, we realize how our society is organized, especially give it the best, sometimes difficult times, I would say, we're going through all around the world because the pandemic is because the uh, um, uh, ideas, po politics, uh, politics ideas, which are not very well, uh, 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 you know what I mean. So thank you very much for for your participation in this conference. Uh, just uh, one more thing, an announcement that is uh, in in principle, uh, this uh, workshop uh, was thought to be together with the school, but uh, on complex systems that Pablo Valenzuela, also uh, uh, Cristina Masoler, who is not here, and uh, Hilda uh, were organizing, and will be. They decided to do this uh, when it's possible to do uh, in person. But uh, I don't know if you have already a date, uh, pa Pablo. Perhaps you want to say something. Uh, there is already some prediction oh, oh, about. Yeah. Hi, Celia. Um... No, no, we have not decided the, the, the day yet, but we are going to decide it soon. So, up to. Okay. Well, this is all <laughs> by the moment. Uh, Celia, is, is Hilda saying something about the, the ICTP or?